For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lynn Dobbs, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost of the University. And we're here tonight to listen to the inaugural lecture of, of uh, Mike Witt. Paul normally does these. I've been here six years and every time there's been a professorial lecture, Paul has done the, uh, the, the opening address. But there's a very exciting event that uh, I'm, I'm able to announce to you is that Paul's had his first grandchild over the weekend. And a little boy, he sent us a photograph where the little boy looks gorgeous and Paul looks in love. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice occasion for him and he asked me to step in and, and I was very pleased and delighted to do so. Mike studied, did his undergraduate and doctoral research at the University of Bath. Um, undergraduate degree in French and German and in his doctoral study, he looked at the work of Jean Luc Goddard and Anne Marie Merville. He joined the Roehampton Institute while he was undertaking his PhD in 1996, and he was awarded a chair in cinema in 2014. I looked through his CV today and was really impressed by the huge breadth of of activity and commitment to the, to the university. During his time here, he initially taught French and then moved on to deliver modules on film and cinema. He's undertaken an impressive range of management duties, including leading two very successful uh, research assessment exercises in 2008 and 2014 in, in his discipline areas. He's continued to research in the area of French-Swiss cinema. Uh, he's written, I think it was seven books, the latest of which contains the transcript of an interview that he, that he conducted with Goddard, and he's got numerous book chapters and articles. He's curated the work of Goddard and others at BFI Southbank and at the Tate Modern, and he's contributed to political films and undertaken extensive media work. I now invite Professor Mike Witt to the stage. Thank you. Many thanks, Lynn, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, thank you also to uh, everyone for, for being here, um, particularly those who I know who have come from some distance. Um, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my late parents and uh, to my family. I feel very fortunate too to have a number of old uh, friends here uh, and these include two people with whom I've collaborated on a large uh, number of Goddard projects over the years, Michael Temple and James Williams, beginning with the Forever Goddard conference that we organised at Tate Modern in 2001. So my thanks uh, to Michael in advance for agreeing to respond to what I'm going to say today. As Lynn indicated, I've been researching and writing about Godard for almost 30 years now. So I like to think I know it pretty well. Um, I am, however, conscious that not everyone lives and breathes Godard. So I'm going to begin by giving a brief overview of his career. So he wrote his first film script at the age of 19 in 1949, and he hasn't stopped producing since. He's made approximately 200 works, including 36 feature films. And during the 1950s, he wrote film criticism, notably for the celebrated journal... In the 50s, he wrote film criticism, notably for the celebrated journal Cahiers du Cinéma. He also made short films, wrote scripts, and worked as a film editor. The international success of his first feature, Abu Souf, Breathless, released in March 1960, ushered in a decade of frenetic filmmaking activity within the context of the French New Wave. He made approximately two features and one or two shorts every year throughout that decade, and it remains the body of work for which he's best known. In 1968, he embarked on a period of political filmmaking, and went on to produce a series of abrasive, low-budget, collaborative left-wing films within the framework of the Zygavertov Group Filmmaking Collective, which you can see down in the bottom left. 
And in 1973, he moved from Paris to Grenoble and established the Sony Mars studio with Anne-Marie Mirbeau and began to explore the possibilities of video and to make work for television. They moved again to Hall in Switzerland in 1977, where they both still live and work. At the end of the 70s, Godard returned to the making of feature films alongside further video work, and he turned his attention to a new set of themes, notably art, nature, religion, and the structuring narratives and myths of Western culture. The image on the slide, the top left there, um, is one of the tableau vivant, in this instance, de la Croix, from the film within the film in his 1981 film, Passion, which is devoted to cinema and painting. The 1980s and 90s, so top right, were dominated for Godard by his monumental videographic cinema history project, Histoire du cinéma. This is an eight-part series lasting four and a half hours, which uses clips from approximately 700 films, together with material from thousands of other sources, paintings, photographs, cartoons, texts, songs, music, recitations, and so on. It offers simultaneously an exploration of the history of cinema and television, of the history of the 20th century, and of the value of films as historical documents, and the possibilities of audiovisual historiography. Released in 1998, it's been widely hailed as a milestone in how we think about these topics. Many of the films, so bottom left here, um, many of the other works, films and videos, that Godard made during the 1990s were extensions of Histoire du Cinéma, including several essay films on European politics, history and culture. And they ranged in focus from the breakup of the Soviet Union to the reunification of Germany and the Bosnian War. In the 21st century, so moving to the bottom right, he staged a major exhibition called Voyage en Utopie, so uh, Travels in Utopia, at the Pompidou Centre. He was awarded an honorary Oscar in 2010, and in 2014 he released a startling experiment in 3D entitled Adieu Langage, or Goodbye to Language. At the age of 87, he's currently back in the public eye, having premiered his uh, new feature, Le Livre d'Image, the image book, at Cannes last Friday. What this brief overview of the various phases of Godard's output doesn't do, however, is give a sense of its diversity. The tendency in film studies has been to focus on his feature films, especially those of the 60s, and to a lesser extent those of the 80s. And the result of this has been a misrepresentation of his artistic practice. Besides his feature films and shorts, and the exhibition I've just mentioned, he's produced an extensive body of television work, as well as commercial commissions, collages, books, audio CDs and video essays. With this in mind, what I'd like to do today is to outline four perspectives in which we might begin to rethink or think afresh about his multifaceted activities. These perspectives are television, video art, graphic art and sound art. And in doing this, I'm going to set aside considerations such as budget size con or conventional hierarchical distinctions between major and minor works. And I'll also disregard his feature films for the time being, but I'll return to these. So, first, television. Godard tried on numerous occasions during the 1960s to get television projects off the ground, but none were realised. He finally embarked on his first film for television in 1967 in the form of a loose adaptation of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Treatise on Education, Émile, which was immediately censored and banned. It wasn't until the 1970s that he and Mierville started to work, uh, to make work for television in earnest. They completed two large-scale television projects in the second half of this decade which together offered a profound critique of the structures, forms and codes of broadcast television. These series are Six fois deux, Sur et sous la communication, and France Tour des Tours des enfants, Six times two, On and under communication, and France Tour Detour, Two Children. So this is the first of the two series. 
Um, it, C fois deux was commissioned at short notice, made extremely quickly, and broadcast in the summer of 1976. Each of the 12 episodes opens in the same way with a shot of a hand inserting a umatic video cassette into the recorder. And you can see this uh, up the top left. This shot suggests the insertion of the series into what Raymond Williams called the programmed flow of broadcast television. Goddard and Mierville set out to disrupt and examine this flow and to, pro to propose through their practice a gentler and more humane way of rendering the world through what they referred to as a regional or a village-based television. They treated the, the screen as an electronic blackboard, often using a video pen, as you can see on this slide, to write or draw directly over the imagery. They constantly foregrounded the mediating processes involved in the making of the programmes and pursued a systematic strategy of deprofessionalisation or amateurisation as a means of casting in relief the arbitrary nature of the conventions of mainstream television. In their next series, France Tour des Tours, they turned their attention to childhood and the socialisation process. The series is both a study of childhood and, as the opening of each episode suggests, through its depiction of the children manipulating the video equipment, which you can see in this slide, top right and bottom left, a presentation of a child's eye view of the world. Loosely inspired by a celebrated 19th century school textbook, the series draws conceptually on three key figures. Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser, for whom television and the education system were both essentially vehicles for ideological programming. Michel Foucault, who in his then recent book, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, had traced the emergence of an insidious form of modern slavery, rooted in what he termed the disciplinary monotony of everyday life. And the sociologist and political activist Robert Linat, who, in 1976, had theorised the idea of the visual filmic study through reference to the work of the Soviet filmmaker Ziga Vertov, who had also been a key reference for Godard. Following these three thinkers, Godard and Mierville examined the conditioning of the human infant as a docile subject of capitalism through the study of 24 hours in the lives of the two schoolchildren. Armed with video and the power of altered motion, they analyse the various instances of manipulation and repetition that make up the children's daily lives, and cast in relief the regulatory constraints and obligations involved in producing what Foucault termed human docility utility. Although compared to Cifroy II, France Tour des Tours appears at, at first glance to sit much more comfortably within the programming grid of television, it constantly undermines the, convention of mainstream, the conventions of mainstream television through the use of, simula of uh, simulation and parody. There's also a dedicated sequence in each episode devoted to a reflection on the rhetoric of primetime TV, which you can see announced here in the title in this uh, image on the bottom right. Following this burst of collaborative televisual work with Mierville in the 1970s, Godard has gone on to make a large quantity of material for television for French, German, Swiss and British TV, some of it co-directed with Mierville, including telefilms, documentaries, advertisements and music videos. And one should all also include on this list Histoire du Cinéma, which was co-produced by and broadcast on the subscription channel Canal Plus. It's astonishing in this context that nobody has yet devoted a full monograph to Godard and to Godard and Mierville and television. Let me now turn to video. Godard championed the medium from the outset as paracinema, an avatar of cinema ideally suited, as he saw it, to rapid, cheap research, to experimentation and to the production of audiovisual notes and sketches. Since 1974, when he and Mierville kitted out their Grenoble studio with state-of-the-art umatic video equipment, he's gone on to make a sizeable body of video work. Even discounting the 32 constituent episodes 
of his three major television series, he's made nearly twice as many works on video as on film overall. And on that basis alone should clearly be considered as much a video artist as a conventional filmmaker. The attraction for Goddard uh, of video was threefold. Ownership of the technology afforded him considerable economic and creative autonomy. By giving him control over the entire production process, from inception to filming and post-production, it gave him the sort of flexibility and freedom more usually associated with artists such as writers and painters. Second, it democratised the filmmaking process by helping to dissolve the traditional divisions and hierarchies between technical roles in mainstream film and TV production. Since the video image can be viewed live by the whole crew at the time of filming, rather than just the cinematographer, it can be immediately reviewed and uh, subjected to collective discussion. It can also, if necessary, be wiped and redone. And third, video allowed him to process all manner of types of imagery, from paintings and photographs to, to freshly shot footage, and to combine and reflect on this material through the use of simple vision mixing techniques, such as split screen, wipes, superimposition, and the use of on-screen text. In a nutshell, he used it as a versatile instrument that allowed him, as he put it, and I quote, to think in images. Among the forms that Godard pioneered was that of the video script. Rather than writing scripts for a number of his films in the late 70s and early 80s, he used video instead as a sort of scrapbook in which to gather ideas and motifs. He's also made a large number of uh, critical and historical video essays. And these are in addition to the eight episodes of Histoire du Cinéma. They include works uh, on topics such as French cinema, Woody Allen, the origins of the 21st century, and fine art. In addition, he made various le video letters and video pamphlets, such as a protest video from 1993, decrying the inaction of the European Parliament in the face of the escalating humanitarian crisis in the Balkans. And lastly, there's an interesting group of commercial commissions made for companies such as the electrical goods chain, Darty, the clothing company, Marité et François Girbault, and France Telecom, the French equivalent of BT. Now, these commissions, although rarely screened and often difficult to see, are quite often uh, major works. And I'd like to show you an example from the 25-minute video entitled Puissance de la Parole, or The Power of Words, that he made for France Telecom in 1988. In it, he brings together two very different works, Edgar Allan Poe's philosophical dialogue, The Power of Words, and James M. Cain's crime novel, The Postman Always Rings Twice, as the basis for a poetic reflection on human communication. The sequence I'm going to show is the end of the video, which includes the closing credits. And it depicts the impact of the words exchanged over the telephone between the young lovers in The Postman Always Lit Rings Twice that brings their relationship to an end. It follows the revelation by the older of the two angels in Pose the Power of Words, whom we see briefly in this clip, that it was he who 3,000 years ago was in fact the young man in The Postman Always Rings Twice whose cry of anguish resulted in the creation of a set of particularly bright stars in the night sky. And what interests me in this sequence, in the context of my discussion today, is something rarely associated by critics with Goddard. The extravagance, the exuberance and the intensity of his videographic style. The least studied aspect of Goddard's oeuvre is his output as a graphic artist which began following his acquisition in the early 1970s of an ostensibly banal piece of equipment, a good quality photocopier. This was no less uh, important a piece of technology for him at the time than a camera or, a, or an editing table. And he used it extensively as a tool for thinking and composing quickly and cheaply in images, without the expense and time delay of professional offset printing to make image text sketches or scripts to send to potential collaborators. This method led to the production of a string of large-scale collage works at the end of the 1970s, 
such as the script that he produced for an unrealised American project on the role of the Mafia in the foundation of Hollywood, entitled The Story, which at one point, as you can see here, was to feature Robert De Niro and Diane Keaton. In this slide, you can see the title page and one sheet from the original collage script, which ran to 66 pages. This was subsequently reproduced in black and white using the photocopier. To make these scripts, Godard combined photographs of the actors from books and magazines with key plot points and fragments of dialogue. They are essentially already films, imagined and expressed on paper, and they should be situated within the context of his theorisation of cinema at its, most, at its most basic, as the juxtaposition of two images whose combination generates an idea or provo provokes a question. As he put it in 1989, quote, one can put a Goya after an El Greco and the two images recount something without the need for a caption. That's cinema. Godard's graphic collage work extends the tradition of paper-based films that goes back at least as far as Jean Epstein in the 1910s. And indeed, Godard will come to present some of his later collages explicitly as films. I'm not going to pursue this topic here, other than to note that the question of paper films and other non-audiovisual iterations of films in the post-cinematic era has been the subject of a good deal of recent theoretical reflection. A particularly large and significant collage work from the 1970s is the special issue of Cahiers du Cinéma that he composed in its entirety in 1979, which is one of his major works in any medium. It comprises 130 pages of collages, including a manifesto for a new form of iconographic film criticism, in which he argues that the blank page shouldn't be used as a place to be filled with writing, but rather as a screen for the analysis of films through image and text. The example in this slide is an extract from his caustic visual critique of Hitchcock's manner of depicting the female face. Since this period, he's gone on to produce a sizeable body of graphic collage work, which encompasses production documents and scripts, letters, poems, press books and film criticism, all composed on paper using a combination of image and text. In the 1990s, a new type of imagery started to appear in his graphic work, as he set aside the photocopier in favour of a printer capable of producing high-quality images directly from video, often presented in conjunction with on-screen text, which was added through means of a basic video special effects generator. This new approach was particularly visible in his press books, and we should note in passing in this regard that Godard is unusual as a filmmaker in that he's frequently created his own hand-crafted press books, many of which are elaborate standalone works. This method of printing straight from video established the mode of practice that fed at the end of the 1990s into his largest graphic collage project to date, the composition of the almost a thousand pages of collages that make up the four volumes of the books of Histoire du Cinéma that were published by Gallimard in 1998. Here are four sample double pages. Godard's aim in these volumes was, it was in part to demonstrate an alternative approach to the making of history in book form, which makes equal use of image and text. The organisation of the visual and textual elements on the page serves to establish a network of correspondences and a unique rhythm across each book. To create them, he stuck the various elements by hand uh, onto the blank sheets exactly where he wanted them with the result that there's considerable variation from page to page and from volume to volume in the scale and number of images used and in the length and position of the textual elements. This emphasis on craft and manual composition lends the book a sculptural physicality and an unpredictable, uneven quality, and it comes as no surprise that he chose the typeface bookman for not for technical reasons, but for the symbolic fusion of man and book in the word itself. So I'm now going to turn to Godard as a sound artist. Sound and the expressive possibilities of the soundtrack have occupied a key position in Godard's filmmaking from the outset. 
1962, he shot Vivre sa vie, My Life to Live, entirely on location using synchronised sound, with noise and voice recorded on a single track at the moment of filming. This technique virtually did away with the need for sound mixing in post-production. It also overturned the classical primacy of dialogue, and placed voice on the same footing as noise, music and ambient sound. This practice was, would later become commonplace in mainstream TV and film uh, practice, so it's easy to forget how daring it was when he attempted it for the first time in this film. Sound became increasingly important for Godard from the late 60s onwards, and in 1983, in Prénom Carmen, first name Carmen, he jokingly depicted his new camera, you see top left here, as a ghetto blaster. This film is structured around rehearsals, as you can see in the other three images, of Beethoven's late string quartets, with the music in the film literally inspiring the imagery, guiding the creative act and driving the narrative forwards. Since 1980, when he signed his film Sauve qui peut la vie, Every Man for Himself, as one, quote, composed by Jean-Luc Godard. He's worked increasingly in the, in the manner of a musician, and many of his later films adopt a symphonic structure divided into movements. This musical analogy applies equally to his actual orchestration of music, voice and noise. And in the 1980s, he made a series of films in which he explored the possibilities of stereo sound collage. These were followed by increasingly ambitious, ambitious sonic compositions, such as his 1990 film Nouvelle Vague, New Wave, for which he used 24 tracks. Unusually, this film was not only released in cinemas, but it was also released by the German contemporary music label ECM Records on CD as a standalone, imageless soundtrack, or rather a soundscape in which the images exist purely in the mind. This CD for Godard is no less cinema than his paper films. And just as a, there's a long history of paper films, so there's an illustrious tradition of films without image tracks that goes back to the earliest days of sound cinema, such as Walter Ruckmann's pioneering sound film without images, Weekend, made in 1930. Moreover, experimental cinema in the 21st century has seen a significant renewal of interest in the production of sound works, conceived specifically for release and presentation to the mind's eye in darkened cinemas. But the pinnacle of Godard's work as a sound artist to date is the five CD set of the remixed soundtracks of Histoire du Cinéma, which was released by ECM Records in 1999. This extended experiment in musique concrète directs the listener's attention towards the ontology of recorded sound and to the, to the historical charge of the sounds contained in the countless film soundtracks that are an equal part of cinema's legacy. Not just the sociological, the linguistic interests of song and speech, but the historical detail caught in the everyday sounds of the countryside and the city, the home and workplace, recorded on disc, tape or film, especially since the commercialisation of synchronised sound. One of the recurrent compositional strategies used in the CDs involves the interweaving of two or more archival film soundtracks and their combination with other sonic elements. In the short sequence I'm going to play from the CD of chapter 3B of Histoire du Cinéma, Godard blends, among other things, a quotation from Jean Cocteau, fragments of Shostakovich's score for Hamlet, and extracts from the soundtracks of Preston Sturgis's The Beautiful Blonde from Bashful Bend, uh, Vincent Manelli's Gigi, and his own Une Femme est une Femme, A Woman is a Woman, and Alpha View, to create a loving tribute to the Hollywood genre films that inspired him and his fellow aspiring filmmakers at the time of the new wave. What's so striking about these CDs is the coherence of the polyphonic uh, oral uh, universe um, produced through the sampling and uh, orchestration of such disparate source materials. The effect is anything but dissonant or cacophonous. As the music critic Mark Swed put it well, quote, 
The texture is so transparently achieved that what we hear are contrapuntal layers rather than cacophony. Indeed, Manfred Eicher, the director of ECM Records, has argued that Godard is a composer at the vanguard of sound remix art, whose work holds its own alongside that of any other contemporary musician. Histoire du cinéma in its various forms exemplifies the diverse nature of Godard's work. It was produ produced for and broadcast on television. It made extensive use of preparatory collages. Godard made video drafts of the various chapters. And the final project was released in the form of box sets of videos and DVDs, books and CDs, to which one might add the Pompidou Centre exhibition, which in many ways was a further extension of the project into the three-dimensional space of the gallery. But where does this reappraisal of the Godardian corpus that I've been sketching leave us more broadly, and what fresh approaches does it invite? One answer would be to produce in-depth studies of the work in the individual uh, perspectives that I've outlined, television, video art, graphic art, and sound art. And to some extent, this is underway, and I salute, for example, Albertine Fox's fine recent study of acoustic innovation in Godard's late work. Another approach would be to focus on the organicity and multimedia nature of Godard's work. And I said that I'd return to the question of his feature films. Considered in this way, the features, which are virtually always accorded pride of place by commentators, become just one component a key one, but just one nonetheless, in an expanded work that includes the various preparatory, satellite and ancillary works that announce, reflect on and extend them. I'd like to give a concrete example, that of Sauf qui pour la vie, from 1980. If we're to think about the film in the manner in which I'm suggesting, we need to approach it first via the written script and the video script that preceded it. So here are a few images from the video script. It's titled simply Scénario de Sauf qui pour la vie. So script of Sauf qui pour la vie. And in it, Godard sets out his initial thoughts for the film and his rationale for his proposed use of slow motion, superimposition and music. It also includes a sequence from François Détour des Enfants, the TV series. So there's a genetic textual bridge between Sauf qui pour la vie and the video experiments that preceded it. The making of the film was followed by the production of several further pieces, all made by Godard. The trailer, the press book, an experimental montage film, and a television programme. Now, I've mentioned that Godard is unusual as a filmmaker for often making his own press books. He's also unusual in that he's made virtually all of his own trailers. These are generally ignored by critics as commercial detritus, but in the context of the framework that I'm proposing here, they constitute an important and formally diverse body of work, which besides introducing the source film, often set out ways of thinking about them. As for the press book that Godard made for Suki Pulavi, it's a particularly rich work. It combines documents derived from all phases of the film's production with a wide range of extra filmic materials, including letters written by Van Gogh to his brother and sister, juxtaposed with a reproduction of Manet's Déjeuner sur l'air, and a cont contemporaneous article attacking the painting. You can see that juxtaposition at the bottom left there. Also, extracts here, hard to see on the slide, but from Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting. Now, I don't have time to discuss this item in detail, but it's a carefully constructed poetic matrix which simultaneously presents, defends, and theorising this film, theorises this film, which had been booed um, at its Cannes premiere in 1980. Following the release of Soki Pulavi, Godard went on to subject it to an unusual experiment within the framework of a series of lectures on cinema history that he was giving at the time in Rotterdam. For one of these lectures, he prepared a special edition of Sauve qui peut la vie, retitled Sauve la vie qui peut, Save Life if you can, which he screened just once during the 1981 Rotterdam Film Festival. So to create this montage film, he took a print of Sauve qui peut la vie, discarded parts of it, 
and combined what remained with reels from four other films. You can see a graphic evocation of the resultant montage on this slide. The four films that he inserted, moving from left to right and top to bottom, were Old and New by Eisenstein and Alexandrov, Cops by Edward Klein and Buster Keaton, The Earth Trembles by Visconti, and the then recent Man of Marble by Andrew Vida in the middle at the bottom. After coming across a detailed description of this forgotten experiment a few years ago by someone who had been present at the screening, I went on to conduct research in the iFilm Museum in Amsterdam on the prints that Goddard had used in 1981, and I subsequently reconstructed it digitally. It's now been screened quite extensively internationally. I believe it's a unique instance of a, of a filmmaker dismantling and recomposing one of their own films in this way through reference to cinema history. While working on an article about this montage film, I made another unexpected discovery. I'd been in communication with the film historian uh, François Albert since I knew that he'd collaborated with Godard on his Rotterdam Film History Lectures in the 1980s. And I was just finalising my article about this montage film, when Alvaro contacted me to say that he just discovered a box of documents relating to this collaboration, which he generously shared with me. The result was that I had to rewrite my article. More significantly, perhaps, the box contained a review by Alvaro, published uh, in 1981 in a small left-wing Swiss publication, of a further completely forgotten television programme that Godard had made at, at the time about Sauvki Pulavi for Swiss TV. Alvara, I should add, had also completely forgotten uh, both about the existence of the programme and writing the article. It seemed unlikely to me at first that a feature-length work by Godard such as this could have slipped completely off the radar, but this is indeed what turned out to be the case. The story is as follows. Radio Television Suisse, RTS, approached Godard with the idea of devoting an episode of their regular film programme to Sauvki Pulavi. Godard accepted, but on the condition that he make the programme. RTS agreed, and the result is an extraordinary televisual remix of and voyage through the source film. It incorporates extens extensive extracts from Sauvki Pulavi, alongside a discussion about it, and about cinema and television generally, between Godard and the critic Christian de Fay together with an extended interview with Godard by one of the film's stars, Isabelle Huppert. This programme has never been included in any Godard retrospective, nor indeed shown at all since it was broadcast in February 1981. So to conclude, I hope I've succeeded in demonstrating that Godard's work is considerably more varied than is generally recognised, and in my view a good deal more interesting. I believe that Consideration of Sauvki Pulavi as a multi-form work, in the way that I've suggested, offers a model for how we might approach the task of constructing a more nuanced and accurate picture of Godard's practice and output in its, in its totality. Not all of Godard's feature films are as rich as Sauvki Pulavi in terms of the associated preparatory and metacritical works that uh, accompany them, but many of them are. And those that aren't are virtually always accompanied by at least one or two related pieces, such as preparatory collages, a trailer, press book or a video essay. If we take these various elements together, including the feature film, we find that each apparently discrete work is always provisional, unfinished and continued in the next, part of a constantly developing transmedial work in progress. In my most recent research, I've taken this approach a step further by incorporating into the picture Godard's numerous uncompleted projects. These constitute a sizeable, invisible or shadow corpus that runs parallel to his completed output. And we repeatedly find traces of, of the abandoned works emerging and taking shape in the later realised projects. Thus, just as we can chart the flow and development of ideas, themes and motifs, between his finished works, so we can do the same between his completed and uncompleted corpora. I'm not exactly sure where this holistic approach will lead, but I believe that it will produce a fresh and different perspective and open up new ways 
of thinking about the work of one of the world's foremost contemporary artists. I've so far identified over 200 unrealised projects stretching back 70 years, so there's been plenty to do. Thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting, a fantastic and awful lecture. Um, I was particularly impressed to note the, the very varied nature of the work, which I hadn't appreciated before. The, the TV, the video, the graphic collage, the, um, the audio, um, and also the feature film. It was a, a very fascinating overview, and, and, um, and I enjoyed it enormously. I think, um, as many of you will know, we don't invite questions. But what we do do is to invite an eminent scholar in the same field to respond on our behalf. And we're very privileged to be able to welcome uh, Mike Temple, who is director of Birkbeck Institute for the Moving Image and the SA Film Festival. His research is, otherwise, is mainly about French cinema, and he's notably written about Jean-Luc Godard, um, and he has publishing an, um, an anthology of writing by the film critic and film creator Richard Wu. Um, he's also worked extensively with, uh, with our Mike, Mike Witt, um, whom he's known for almost exactly 20 years. He's organised conferences and study days, curated a number of film seasons and edited several books. And I would like to invite uh, Mike Temple to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it is a great honour to be asked to do this. And uh, when Mike contacted me, I thought to myself, five minutes, say some nice things about Michael Witt. Can't be that difficult. <laughs> because five minutes is very short, and I'm not the only person who loves Mike and has immense respect and affection for him uh, as a scholar and also as a human being. Uh, what I will say is going to be a little bit personal because we are extremely good friends as well as uh, colleagues. So uh, if I am here, it's probably less as an eminent scholar but more as a very long-standing and devoted friend. Um, it is true, and this is kind of a, almost seems fun, almost seems funny, but for me it's actually quite moving, is we have known each other for almost exactly 20 years. So Mike was saying at the beginning that he had uh, spent 30 years or more in the company of Jean-Luc Godard, and I have spent 20 years in the company of Michael Witt and uh, Jean-Luc Godard as a kind of, as, as kind of three-way uh, friendship, as it were. We have done a ridiculous number of things together, uh, film seasons, retrospectives, uh, appearing at conferences together, writing together, um, editing books together, uh, and so forth. And not just about Godot, which I think is a very important thing to say, because despite uh, the wonderful talk that Mike just gave, and despite the fact that he is obviously known as the probably the greatest living Godot scholar on the planet, I don't think there's really a great deal of competition out there. There might be one or two but he basically is the man. So, I mean, you know, you, you were very lucky to have heard a 50-minute summation of his thinking on the topic because he is simply the, the, the outstanding Godot scholar. Um, so we've done all those things together, but I'm not saying that in a way to try and take any credit. <laughs> I was thinking about a kind of Godot quite like sporting metaphors, and I was thinking of a kind of Tour de France metaphor. You know, that, you know in the Tour de France, you have the main rider, the one who ultimately is going to win the Tour de France, despite what might happen in an individual stage. And then you have the person who's kind of maybe a little bit in front, maybe a little bit uh, 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 beside, maybe a little bit behind, who's kind of accompanying the, the, the star rider. But I know, like the, 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 the other type of uh, cyclist, that when it gets to the time trial, the individual time trial, or when it comes to the mountain stages, my job is to sort of sit back and admire uh, someone who is going into literally another sphere from anything that I could do. So that would be my kind of metaphor for the with in the, the things that, we have, that I've done with Mike, whether it be about God or other aspects of French cinema and cinema. 
So from that very privileged position, but I think, I hope, specifically defined position of my witness, um, there are three things, Mike, which over those 20 years have really uh, stood out about your work uh, and also, to some extent, the, the person that you are. And I would say those are your originality, uh, your integrity, and your generosity. Um, so I'll just say a very brief word about those three main features of Mike's work, but also the person that he is. First of all, uh, in terms of originality, it's a word that we learn when we first start doing scholarship, when we first start doing a PhD, about we have to make an original contribution to knowledge. And we often scratch our heads about what that originality might mean, what it might mean to be original. But in a sense, we're bringing something to a field. You know, that's what you say to PhD students when they're starting. You know, your job is to kind of bring something original to a field. It's not being that absolutely original in any kind of romantic sense of the term. I think what's really extraordinary about the originality of Mike's research, and I think it came across in the talk uh, that he just gave, is that he hasn't just found another way of thinking about Goddard. He hasn't just found a way of interpreting Goddard differently. Okay? What he's actually done is to change what we mean when we talk about the work of Goddard. In other words, so Mike's research, the originality of Mike's research, what really just blows everybody else away, I think, is that he has really focused on the corpus. He has expanded the corpus, the thing, the objects, the body of objects that we put under the name of Goddard. And that is the contribution, I think, a really profoundly important contribution, which changes everything that we might uh, do subsequently. It's not just a question of interpretation, it's actually a, a work as a, as a historian. And I think it's very important to understand that Mike is essentially a historian, and he approaches the job of studying film, and Goddard in particular, as a historian, with the methodology of a historian. And therefore, the question of the corpus, the objects, the materiality, are absolutely uh, vital. So the fact that he chose to work on the Sonimage period was not uh, you know, an easy choice. It was actually engaging with an object which had been literally neglected and around which there was very, very little uh, conventional uh, film scholarship at the time. Um, I think what he was just saying about the Sofi Buddha, the constellation, all the different objects, the different material things that one can think about as Sofi Buddha, which are not just the fiction film and a question of interpreting that fiction film. But also to give a, I know, millions of examples, but the other example is Mike dug up a whole load of political journalism, written journalism, that Goddard had written in the late 60s and early 70s, and simply dug that up, some of it had been written anonymously or with a pseudonym, and brought that to the debate. So there's a sense in which that desire for originality is bringing something material to what we want to then go on to talk about, to the debate in that sense. So going along with the um, originality and this sense of completely changing our understanding of the corpus goes what I think is really another really important factor when thinking about Mike's work, which is in his integrity. Now, obviously, by integrity, I mean his honesty and his rigour, and I think that that goes with the, the terrain of working as a historian. But it's also to do with time. I think that you know, Mike is somebody, in an exemplary fashion for all of us, he's taken his time to do things. Okay? Without, and most of you know that in the last sort of 20, 25 years, we have done our research under a pressure to produce, produce, produce. To, to produce research which is quickly quantifiable, not just quantifiable, quickly quantifiable, for all sorts of reasons which I obviously won't go into and which are perfectly understandable. But one of the things I've always admired about Mike is that he has never taken the easy option and he has always taken his time. And I think that is something that I respect enormously. Uh, obviously, we can tease him about that as well. Why the hell did it take him so long to write <laughs> Jean Luc Godard, cinema historian? Um, and I think that it, you know it was also because he wanted to take his time. And having sort of obviously spent so much time in and out of different projects with Mike over the years, I know that he was taking his time because he wanted it to be as good as it could possibly be. Because he wanted to do as much 
uh, material historical research as he possibly could. So that amazing book, which is you know won prizes uh, for for its scholarship, again is not about just finding another clever way of interpreting Israeli cinema. It's actually changing how we think about it in uh, a material way, and notably by inscribing it into a long, long, long open history of audiovisual histories of uh, cinema. There would be, be one example of many, but also having sat th worked through some of these projects with him, I know what it means when I say he takes his time. I mean, <laughs> he really does take his time. That if anyone's seen the rather beautiful Forever Goddard book that the three of us, with the good friend James Williams here, edited together, some of you will know that one of the extraordinary things is that there's about 100, 150 page illustrated filmography of all of Goddard's work as we knew it at that time. Now, each work is represented in a completely equal, egalitarian way. They are all given the same respect, whether they last you know, eight hours or whether eight, they last eight seconds. And each of those works is carefully uh, illustrated. Now, I can promise you, having lived through that, you, and particularly, well, we, but particularly you, really took your time to find interesting images, in some cases for works for which there was no illustration in the conventional sense um, available. Um, and so again, it was, it was, if it's a beautiful object, the same goes with Cinema Historia. I know that you were incredibly obstinate about waiting until the, the damn publisher would let you have colour images in your book. And those of you who don't work in film studies, one of the great paradoxes about film studies is that most film studies books are incredibly dull and uninteresting to look at visually, whereas Trevor Goddard, but also the cinema, Goddard Cinema Historian, is a beautiful beautiful object just to hold in your hands and think about vision. It's not to make it look nice like a coffee table book, it's to think about the, the, the topic, the serious topic in a visual fashion. Um, there are many, many examples um, that I could give. I do want to tell one though, which is the thing about when uh, this, is, this is the integrity and the fact of taking your time. When Mike was commissioned by Sight and Sound to go out to Roll, to interview Godard about his latest film. Of course, Godard, as you know, just, like a lot of filmmakers, is incredibly bored with people always asking the same questions, more or less well-informed, often rather sort of in homage to the great master. And so, as almost as a provocation, he just tends to say ridiculous things or kind of rather gnomic, incomprehensible things. So what he didn't realise, though, was that Michael Witt was going to be thrown out to interview him. And what did Michael Witt do? He didn't just try and think about some extra clever questions that no one had thought about before or try and provoke Goddard about something that's going to be a little bit controversial. He very carefully sat down, I don't know who told me about it, and he chose a series of images, some of which Goddard himself had forgotten that he'd ever made and had no idea where they came from. He sat down with Goddard and their whole conversation was based around those images that Mike had researched and materially taken along to lay on the table. The interview, Mike never has told me the full details of this interview, but whereas you would expect such an interview to last maybe 25 minutes and then the next person comes along, God would not let Mike go home. He kept on saying, I can call you a taxi, I can call you a taxi. When's your flight? So I don't know if it was eight hours or however long it was, but God would not let Mike go home. Uh, that day, and I think that's a sense of when I say putting in the work and the, the, the integrity of everything that Mike does, uh, that is for me uh, a very good um, illustration. Finally, then, on just the question of generosity, what I mean by that obviously is a personal generosity. I've rarely met anyone so generous in terms of sharing material, if anyone sort of, you know, whether it's some obscure document or image or film, Mike is incredibly generous with sharing the work. He doesn't keep it for himself in a secret box, at least as far as I know. Um, but it's also a vision of cinema. I mean, yes, he's personally very generous. Yes, he's intellectually very generous. But I also think, as the talk just illustrated, he has a very generous vision of what cinema is. I've always loved the fact that when Mike was made professor, he's, he wanted the title Professor of Cinema. I don't know why, it just brings a smile to my face. Because within that, I would say what his full title, and I would suggest that Roham can change it now, is Professor of Everything That Cinema Can Be and of Everything That Can Be Cinema. 
I suggest you put that on the website straight away. Because that is, no, folks, that is what we're talking about. Mike has a very Godardian sense of what cinema is. So the word cinema does is a very generous, open concept which in a sense some might, be, might, might see as kind of eating everything up, but I don't think it is that. I think it's a sense that cinema is, uh, you know, is uh, 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 a multi-faceted, multimedia um, uh, project um, where different things, a piece of paper, uh, a piece of sound, um, a, um, a trailer, uh, uh, a piece of publicity like a press book, all of this can be part of what we consider to be cinema. And I think that that came across beautifully in what you were saying uh, in your uh, talk today. So that generosity, I think, also um, carries over into a lot of the teaching that Mike has done. I know there's one field where, again, I would say that um, audiovisual, what he calls audiovisual criticism, in other words, taking that sense of using video and digital media to critically engage audiovisually with film is something that Mike has been doing for 20 years uh, in this institution here in a way that's very much been slightly off the radar. It's become very, very fashionable to talk about videographic criticism, uh, etc. And lots of people are doing very, very interesting things. But it's important to remember that Mike, because of that very open sense, that very generous sense of what cinema is, has actually been doing that stuff. Um, for, for the last um, 20 years. And in fact, he wrote a very interesting article about it recently, which included many, many links to work done by Roehampton students. Um, and it always strikes me how proud Mike is when he talks about that particular work, and then one of those students turns up later on in some sort of competition or, or in a film festival or something like that. He always has that in mind. So it's about a generosity which here is involved developing a field of study and sharing and including students and colleagues within that development. So finally then, it's a generous sense of what cinema is. Cinema for Mike is experimental film, it's militant film, it's video art, it's so-called artist moving image, it's installations, it's exhibitions, it's documentary film, it's television, it's mainstream, it's popular, it's everything. It's amateur film, and it's also even uh, so-called industrial film. And just one last thing to say, I remember Mike saying to me once, I can't even remember where we were, but he told me that his original engagement with film, when cinema first kind of hit him, was at school, and they were showing industrial films about the processes whereby steel was made, or something like that, and that's when Mike fell in love with cinema. And I think that's the kind of the, the sense of that being one's origin of one's love of cinema, which in Mike's case has led to a fantastic professional and personal engagement through research. And the fact that it came from there is nicely sort of decentered in a way that I think is very uh, productive and uh, very creative. So um, I'll stop there just to say those three things are the standout things when I was trying to think about you, Mike. Um, and just to say, it's been an amazing uh, privilege to be such a good friend of yours and to spend so much time together working on all these projects. So um, it's just, uh, just to say thank you very much.